I'm Orwan Elabia, the artistic director of ITFA, and I'm absolutely honored to be here with all of you, with our amazing partners at Free Press Unlimited, and with you, Anna, my precious friend. It's uh, truly difficult to say words now, but uh, you know, I never knew the family name of Mantas. He was always this brilliant guy, and we would meet because we're two smokers in a world with not many smokers. <laughs> so we knew each other as the two guys who would leave the room and go out to smoke. And we started, after a few such encounters, just to give a sign to each other, to go out. And we had amazing conversations where we most of the time disagreed and got heated, and then the cigarette ends, and then we pump fists and go back. And then when I read the news about the filmmaker who was murdered in Ukraine, I thought I didn't know him, because I only read the family name. But then, within a few hours, the photo of Mantas was everywhere. And it was so shocking <laughs> to find out that I know him. I know a brilliant guy, a fellow smoker, a man who was full of energy, but very calm. You can't imagine how he was always centered. He was always calm. He had sparkle in his eyes all the time. He, was, he would say very few words. He never was a man of too many words. And that, I think, shows in the way he saw the world in his films. In Mariupolis 1, the first film, I didn't have one because he didn't know there would be two. In his first film, that was a brilliant film that toured the whole world, he just went there right after the war began in 2014, and he, uh, he clearly, in the film, you see how he fell in love with the people of that city. And to me, there is no more meaningful action than what he did with Anna when the invasion started in February, and he felt it's his people. So he traveled quite a long trip together with Anna. They went together and went back. He could not leave them. He went back to the people he lived with, the people he made a film with, but also the people who gave him a film, who gave him a lot of love, because when they were under such painful attack, he could not leave them alone. He had to be with them. So, the. Anna and the editor uh, of, the, uh, of the film, Dunya Suchov, and others did to finish the work after Manta's death was in every sense of the word heroic, because of course it's not a finished film, but it is an amazing document of a film that did not reach its end. Now I will have the honor of inviting Anna and Ruth to join me on stage so that we talk a little more concretely about these things. Anna? The big question that brings us together in the face of such a, a bewildering, shocking situation or a crime uh, and that is always a, a, an obvious meeting point also between the work that Free Press Unlimited does and the work that I uh, and ITFA does through different, in different ways, is the question of uh, impunity and the question of what can we do. How, what should we do? To me, there is um, there's so much that we can do when somebody is in danger. But when things are so quickly extreme and someone is already murdered, what can we do? Well, I do believe in justice. I do believe in 
the need for accountability. And I know that you've been doing a lot at Free Press and Limited Truth on trying to examine our responsibility in, in relation to impunity. So it's a general question, not only about the case of Mantas and uh, what happened to him. Generally speaking, can you tell us how you understand our responsibility after the fact? Because it, to me, it's very painful, to be honest, that we did not get the chance to save Mantas. Mm -hmm. and, and others around the world, in Ukraine and in other places around the world, that uh, it's so extreme that it was only after the fact that we can think, can we do something? What can we do? What should we do, in your opinion, Ruth? Try to do everything we can, but uh, the rates of impunity are staggering. Eight out of ten killed, murdered journalists, the perpetrators and the masterminds behind it are still free. They are not brought to justice. And, um, and we must stop this, and we must try to do everything we can to bring them to justice, the perpetrators. And, to, um, and what, we, what you can do is, of course, we try to advocate for special task forces to, with experts to um, investigate these kind of cases um, and to make sure that all the evidence is still there. Um, we uh, actually um, try to set up with our project Save a World for the Truth to bring justice for um, in the case of cold cases. Uh, so we investigated cold cases and we were able to find new evidence to talk to eyewitnesses who were never interviewed during the uh, proper investigation. And through these kind of investigations you can actually try to reopen cases to uh, convince prosecutors yeah. to uh, again uh, uh, look at the case and uh, bring them to justice. So that is what you can do and what we all should try to do. And I believe, Anna, you've been you, you have not been working on this, you have been doing uh, heroic work I must say, on collecting information and evidence, and you succeeded in getting one of the world's most accomplished lawyers and uh, law firms or law organizations to take on the case and try to uh, uh, make sure that the right the, the perpetrators are brought to justice somehow. Can I ask you to tell us a bit about the case? About the uh, what is the case now? Um, the, I, unfortunately, I just received the autopsy report recently, so everything very slow. But um, anyway, uh, I continue to work on the investigation. I found some uh, photo of uh, suspects. I uh, brought it to police department. Uh, we're waiting for ballistic now, and um, yeah, from Vulcan Calix company, my lawyers went uh, to Lithuania, so we kind of pushing a case. Of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm writing to general prosecutors in Ukraine, but it's like more than forty thousand cases there, so the response very poor. Um, but anyway. Um, I believe that after ballistic, uh, we uh, will try to contact. Um, we already contacted um, ICC, International Criminal Court, uh, but I'm not sure that they are interested now in uh, individual cases. And um, uh, but we now have. It's very unfortunate that it's now already 42 years journalist. Yeah, I remember it was 35. Or something. Yeah. Can I get back to you, Ruth, on, on this point? Because also in my personal experience, and uh, as someone who is involved in human rights work and campaigning and so on, it's always a challenge in such situations to try and balance the individual case with the collective disaster. How do you see this? I, uh, can we not, or should we not, or should we 
use the individuals as uh, uh, icons or as a way to uh, defend or advocate the collective? Or should we keep working in, collect in, in a sense collectively? Should we be uh, uh, seeking uh, accountability for 40,000 cases or should we uh, pick a few that can make every other case clear? I think this is an ethical and legal question that uh, I, that I never managed to find an answer to. Do you? Do you what, how do you think about that? Well, actually, we think uh, that um, making an individual case gives uh, gives the, the the murder journalist a face, and and otherwise it's just a number, right? Yes. One of those many the staggering numbers of killed journalists. By giving the person a face, um, uh, asking for the testimonies of their um, colleagues, or relatives, that has impact. We actually organized a people's tribunal um, with real judges, but it's not a legal uh, tribunal. Um, and we had a lot of testimonies of uh, former colleagues, of journalists, of the relatives, and that was so incredibly uh, touching and moving. And maybe we will not uh, reach the, the, the real justice by putting the perpetrators behind bars, but at least the family and also the colleagues had, had a way to, to speak up and to speak out and to uh, tell the story. And um, in some cases it was picked up in the, in the country, um, like in Mexico or in Pakistan, it was picked up by the media, there were, people were talking about it. And so that's also true. Um, if you keep the memory alive of this person, then he did not die for nothing, right? <coughs> so I think giving this person the face and talking about it, it really helps. Anna, what would you, what do you hope to see happen? Uh, at least I want to see of all the testimonies of all, all witnesses and uh, collect. I understand that it's war going on there, so no one would drag now to the court. But uh, anyway, war gonna finish, and uh, I believe in injustice and. Um, I hope that all collected evidence now will help later on to find who did that. Yeah. And to also keep, yes, Manta's memory and that exactly that it's like it's a people and people do have a name. It's not just headlines. No, exactly. And, and there's a clear point about this case, about the murder of Mantas, is that um, it's essential to, to, to remember, which is that uh, in, in many cases, colleagues and filmmakers and journalists are murdered in, in a war zone uh, because there is bombardment or because there is collective punishment or because somebody is shooting uh, blindly. Uh, in the case of Mantas, we have to acknowledge that he was killed with full uh, uh, awareness, knowing who he is, and straightforward, he was murdered personally and not by by mistake or as part of a group. So in a way there is a direct crime that is not only uh, a war situation. Uh, he was not passing by and there was bombardment. He was directly personally murdered. And, and I think this clarifies again the value or the importance of what he was doing and the way that his uh, uh, his being itself was felt as an enemy to someone who was perpetrating many other crimes so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to Anna that, that, that she took all the risk of saving the footage because they did not kill Mantas when you saved the footage. Yeah. 
what has been killed by um, when he col was um, collecting people um, and we wanted to evacuate some people so Mantas was not with camera in his, his hand as uh, all papers wrote so and it's big difference exactly when person especially journalist killed by missile by mistake or was killed in cold blood and it's a big difference and they murdered journalist and filmmaker and it's big difference that's why it should be like we should be all aware that uh, it's not just crimes against against humanity but it's crimes against journalists who <coughs> risk in their life to bring awareness for everyone and actually showing what's going on there and uh, the voice is just taken off and uh, brutally and yeah. There's so much work that needs to be done by specialists, by lawyers and investigators but as far as we in this room go, as far as we are accustomed <coughs> that it uh, uh, are, uh, uh, can do, we will keep on showing this film, we will keep on talking about this, and we will keep on telling the world what happened. Uh, and I invite you all to do just that if you, if you like, if you want, if you would like to contribute. Um, we lost an amazing filmmaker who could have been uh, making more films again and again, who was murdered. This project that Mata Sanana were working on uh, um, in Mariupolis was of course ignited or started because of the uh, invasion, but they were also working on other projects. They had other films and they were working towards a lot of other things in the future. And all of these things were just stopped by some uh, <coughs> criminal without any sense of, uh, without conscious, basically. So, whatever your tool is, help all of us not forget. Uh, help us keep Mantas alive. Um, I, I, what you did is beautiful. Ruth, Leon, and the entire team of Free Press Unlimited. I'm grateful and I'm proud to be partnering with you uh, uh, at this moment. Anna, all respect. Thank you. Thank and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.